Danny boy. Wayne, how are you, mate? <laughs> I'm, I'm very well. How I'm are looking you? forward to today. We've just had a beautiful chat off air with our guest, uh, Sarah Rowe. Welcome to the Dawson D Show. Thank you for having me. I think we've got a full podcast already on the gates. Oh, I wish we had microphones set up then because we covered a lot, but hopefully we'll cover a lot of that uh, in the upcoming chat. But just to begin, what percentage of you would you consider you are Australian now? Oh. My mum would be watching this show, <laughs> so I'm going to say I am 100%. Irish. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. So will you and go Can't back there? Words. Will I go back there? That's a very controversial question. <laughs> but, uh, I at this point I've been here six years, so I think a big proportion of my life is here. But at the same time I go back to Ireland, I'm like, Ireland gets me. Yeah. I get oh, Ireland. okay. That's the only thing. I think that there's there's really like the culture is very similar, but it's also quite different. But again, Ireland is a very small place and mm. I see myself here definitely for the foreseeable anyway. When they say, when you say they get you, is it, what's the difference in humour? Like is humour a part of it too? Humour is a massive part yeah. of Irish culture. Yeah. Culture is actually essentially all we know. I reckon. <laughs> yeah. Like everything is made into a joke, mm. be it death, be it whatever, be it the worst case scenario is always made into a joke. So sometimes I find that I might make a joke over here and people kind of go, did you really say that? And I'm like, clearly taking the piss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do I even have to explain myself there? Yeah. But I even remember the first week I was over in Australia. It was like humor was just a tiny bit different. Like it is quite similar, but like there was moments where, you know, there'd be a break in conversation. I'd be like, I'll say this. But I had to think, will I say this? Whereas I don't think in Ireland I just say mm. and do. Whereas I was like, should I say that? And then I was like, oh, moment's gone. I'm actually just a mute in the corner. I'm just the quiet girl at training who is the ex- exact opposite to who I am. Yeah. So, yeah, there is there is a few differences. But now I think the longer I'm here, the more I understand everything over here mm. and definitely have come on board with the Australian humour. Well, we feel very connected to the Irish here, even though, like, you look at it geographically and you almost can't go any further in the world than probably, you know, the from Ireland to Australia, but I'm also interested to hear what are some of the other cultural differences you've found since being in Australia compared to Ireland? Yeah, there's there's lots of differences. I think, I suppose, in terms of sport, the upcoming, like, Gaelic football is massive in Ireland and it's an amateur sport, so probably coming from the amateur world to the professional world, there's really diff- there's a lot of differences in the culture there and even the way we're coached. Like, everything in Ireland is about, like, being resilient, being hardworking and never say die attitude. Like playing, growing up playing soccer as well. I remember when I was playing, we played against England, Sweden and Spain and we had no right to beat them. But like we pride ourselves on being a harder working team. And mm. then even if we get an injury, essentially, it's like you can push through. Like it, it's always that mindset. So when I came over to the professional world over in Australia, it was like, you know, I'd have a sore hamstring or a sore quad, actually. And I was like, ah, it's just so I can't say anything because it's like that would be considered soft. But then all of a sudden I tear my hamstring and people are like, why didn't you say anything? And I'd be like, well, it's soft of me to say that I have a little sore ham- sore <laughs> quad, but all of a sudden it's torn. And then, you know, the club would be like, well, that's kind of unprofessional of you. Whereas I'd be like, well, in Ireland, this is the way. It's so like really small things. It's, it's very much just an undertone in things. And... The way I suppose we think about things, we even have Irish girls, um, myself, Ashley and Jordan, and then another girl, Marin, at Collingwood. And there's things that happen in meetings that we kind of go, we just kind of look at each other and say, <laughs> that wouldn't be the way in Ireland. But we just, we understand it now. And I think it just takes time. But there's there's lots of differences, even like, even the way you guys live life. Like, it's like you've, Australians have a really good work-life balance, whereas in Ireland, it's work hard, play hard. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, Monday to Friday, grind, like train hard and work until eight o'clock at night. And then everyone goes out a lot at the weekend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple of pints. Yeah. A couple of pints of Guinness, you know, that's just what Irish people do. But then at the same time, we're very, like while we're like full of humor and full of life and all that, we take what we do very seriously. So we take work very seriously. We take training very seriously. But then we're the complete on other end of the spectrum. So it's like very, um, very extreme, I would say. Whereas I find Australians like very balanced. Like it's, you work, you play, you exercise, you prioritize health. Mm-hmm. And it's very much a balanced lifestyle. Whereas in Ireland, maybe we could learn a bit from that. You would have been probably 21, 22 when you came over? Yes. Yeah. So how's the, 
how's the dynamic with family? Like you, you've said off air, you're a really family orientated person. I'm sure you miss your family, but what were they like when you made the, the decision? I don't know. Was the original plan to be six years or was it one year? And now have they been over since? Yeah, it's definitely, it's a really hard one because I think family for me is everything. Like I adore my family. I'm so close with, even when I just ring my mom, I'm like the peace I get just from hearing her voice on the other side of the phone. But it's, I think what I find and when I find I really miss them is when something goes like slightly wrong over here or like even injury or you're performing poorly or something, you aren't as resilient, but you kind of quietly deal with your problems and then get over them and don't really talk to anyone because you're kind of like, who understands it other than your family? And it's like, when I when you have a problem in Ireland, you go home, you sit in the kitchen with your mom and dad and they tell you to stop with your nonsense. Whatever you're going on about at the time, whereas you don't feel you have that same access to, I suppose, the unrequited love that they give you and the understanding that they have of you. And I think it's like, you know what parents are like, it's like they understand you for exactly who you are, what you're trying to put out. Whereas you don't always have those people in your life. Like, you know, if you can count on your hand how many of those people you have who really understand what you're trying to get across. So the club are amazing. They they do their absolute best to be there for us. And so do my friends over here. But I think at times like that, you're kind of like, oh, I really need, I really need to just sit down. And, and I need a home cooked well, meal. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. But so I think at the start, I was like, oh, I'll come over for a year and then I'll go back to Ireland essentially. But then every year I was here, I was like, I just always felt myself drawn. It also felt like a big challenge. Like, you know, not understanding the sport at all, not having a clue of anything. I was like, I need to, like, I need to work really hard at this and I'm not going to be happy until you feel like you'll never as a sports person, unfortunately, feel like you accomplish anything because you're always striving. But I, until I, you know, get better, keep getting better and feel like I've gotten to a place where I believe that I've reached my potential in the sport. What what was your, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I lived interstate last year for about eight or nine months and we flew back and forth and did the show, but I struggled with that. Yeah, like just you? living interstate. You know, what way? Just like again, I, I just, family. yeah, just like just being able to drive forty five minutes or half an hour to your parents' place and mm. just pop in, like just something simple as that. Because we're lucky with FaceTime and things like that. Um, but being also family orientated, and Danny is the, the same or D. Um, yeah, just being able to like just spontaneously just pop in. Like mm. I missed that. Yeah, and you kind of in ways feel like selfish nearly being away from family because you're like you feel like you want to be there for them as well. And you feel sure. like by being so far away that you're doing your thing, you're focusing on your career and you're not looking after them the way you should. So sometimes you feel like there's a sense, definitely a sense of guilt there as definitely. well. So I'm always like, mum is like, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? I hope you mean, <laughs> she's like, what, like you need to come home in the next year, two years. And I'm like, mum, please, I already feel guilty enough. But at the same time, I love what I do here. But she's like, she's like, I actually don't care. She's like, I'm only taking the piss out of you. <laughs> <laughs> like, she says I'm that. Like, you yeah. Don't. I, yeah, I was like, it's one of those situations where, where she's like, I'm joking deadly serious with everything she says <laughs> when she says come home from Australia. But yeah, it is. There's definitely a sense, yeah. sense of guilt. Yeah. This episode of Dawson D's show, co-hosted by one of the members of the Peaky Blinders, is brought to you by Fleet Plan Hire Solutions. Thanks, mate. Uh, hope you guys don't mind the new head accessory. I like it. So intrigued to hear what you think. But we talk about Fleet Plan every week, yes. uh, the amazing projects they're always doing. But did you know that they do machine hire as well? I'm talking excavators, bobcats, bulldozers, and even when the job's done, you get a nice little sweeper there just to clean the whole thing up. How good is that? Head to fbh.com.au to find out more. Back to the episode with Sarah. Our knowledge of Gaelic football is that we kind of basically understand the basic rules. Um, we understand it exists. We know it exists. We probably couldn't name too many players. I want to know what your knowledge of Australian rules football was when you were living in Ireland before coming out here, did you know it even existed? Did you know the rules? Did you know anything? So like, <laughs> this is the way I operate, which is like, I always have a big picture plan in mind. So when they said, come over to Australia and play Australian rules, I was firstly like, what's that? And then I was like, it's international rules, just the same as that. And I was like, mm, it's not that, okay. Right, so then I looked it up and I was looking at all the hits and I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. definitely not for me. And I was like, anyway, say yes, figure out how, how after. So went over and was like, I didn't know, like, I honestly didn't know anything. Like, but as well, I was like, I'll go home and I'll work on it and I'll come back and I'll know way more by the time I get back. And I had six months of playing Gaelic football just before I, after I'd signed the contract. 
but the way I, like I pride myself on being really present and doing what I'm doing at the mm. time so I was like no I'm actually playing Gaelic football at the moment forget about Australian rules I'll just deal with that when I get to it so basically the first day I landed I w- kicked the ball and I was like this is so embarrassing but you've already signed the contract <laughs> I was like and the imposter syndrome was at an all time yeah. so uh, just going two steps back you said they they asked me to come over to Australia who's they who who so brought you over manage, um, I was with a company um, OMP Sports who were a management company who worked with AFL and they watched okay. our All-Ireland final in Australia so, in Ireland so they've handpicked you as a potential prospect for the AFLW is that how it works yes so they okay. sent an email and said I watched the All-Ireland final I think you'd be really suited to gotcha. AFLW okay. and at the time that year Corus Taunton was the first one to go out and then I followed the following year so gotcha. it was okay. kind of the flow and effect was starting at that point but um yeah when i came out i was like i remember nick maxwell was the guy who like interviewed me essentially at the start and i just was blown away by like the facilities everything like so appreciative of everything i'm like what so like i can use all these Wait, things there's a, like, there's a sauna <laughs> 20 questions with sarah um so yeah i was like there's so many things there's so many resources so you, i was like so you mean that all the players can use all this stuff they're like yeah like i was like it's it's a business as well as a sport. What like, you know, everything in yeah. Ireland was so hard to get sponsorship to, you know, players had to fundraise money. So like that's all we knew. So then Irish players come over and we appreciate so much what the club puts and the support that they put around us. And, you know, to be I suppose the best that you can be. But yeah, in terms of the sport, I do remember like I was straight away really respected Maxi and I was like, you know, I definitely wanna I wanna impress him now when I get out onto the field and I believe that I can do this and then threw me a ground ball and I was like, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> this is hard. Yeah. I was like, what? I was like, why is this so unpredictable? I yeah. was like, the round ball, you just know exactly where it's going to bounce, where it's going to pop up and like, you know what you're going to do next and it's also a perfectionist game. So like, Gaelic football and soccer, it's like, if the ball goes from A to B, well done. But even like in soccer, you know, if you pass it to someone's left foot, foot versus their right foot that's a small error but like if you don't know the game really well you mightn't see that but then in AFL I could not get my head around the organized chaos like I was like what do you mean they were like so what are you going to do when they're trying to coach me at the start so what are you going to do with the ball when you get it I was like I'm going (laughs) to give it to the free player (laughs) that's to my left or to my right Uh, easy and they were like yeah, but what if it's windy and wet? I was like, I'm still going to give it to the free player. You know, A plus B equals C. This is obvious, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, no, Roy. If it's a wet and windy day, like we want you to go long down the line to the contest. I'm like, oh, so to a 50-50 chance. I was like, that's embarrassing. Kind of thing. I was like, why would I go there? I was like, when there's a free player there, we draw the next player, next player, and then we get the ball out the back. Makes sense. Like, it does make total yeah. sense. So it's like the way Gaelic football works and like, you know, situations that happen in games that you go, okay, if, you know, obviously like footy is grey or whatever, but like you prepare for all sorts of situations. You have conversations about if this arises, this is, you know, this is what we want to try to do. Whereas for like Gaelic football is very, in, like you're, you play on your instinct all the time. So I couldn't understand that. So I remember playing on the wing. <laughs> Oh, they would have hated me so much. I was playing on the wing and I just go diagonal. Like I just go across <laughs> the other side of the field. I'm like, what's the problem? There's space there. Like that's what you do. You run into space, you get the ball, kick the ball to space and all. Like, no, no. Like people be like, What is she doing? So there was so many moments like that. Yeah, what I are the terms like? High position to play in the wing. Keep, keep your width, keep your shape, all that stuff. <laughs> I literally said to the club, I was like, I'm gonna get length and width tattooed on my <laughs> <Like the wind. laughs> if I hear that one more time from you guys I was like I'm just going to do my own thing they're like you're going to be sitting on the bench <laughs> Well, D- D's a fellow winger himself, yeah. or wingman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very hard position to play, Sarah. Yeah. I understand. Oh, yeah. Very frustrating. Did you? <laughs> you know, we're getting there. Did you get? Um, well, you're saying you knew, you didn't know anything about AFL, but obviously there was the international rules. Yes. Did you watch that growing up? I had a couple of my friends played in it, so I d- did take an interest in that. But I remember watching the Australian boys play in it and just find it so funny how they kick the round ball. Oh yeah. Like, and I'm like, equally people are laughing how they re kick the oval ball. Yeah. But when you see Australians kick the round ball, they just like do it so differently. Yeah. 
It is you, a different d- game. Well, do you remember the Biffs, the big fights? That's what no. we... Really? Did you not yeah. see any of the big fights? Like, oh. talking... Uh, I wouldn't say I, I watched it, but like... Yeah. Before you leave, and we should probably put this up, but there's this classic footage where... Oh. It, uh, I can't remember. It was one of the biggest stadiums in Ireland, and the Aussies were is this, over. Is this Chris Johnson? I can't remember who the players were, but it's literally like welcome to the coverage of the game, blah, blah, blah. And it's zooming in <laughs> and you can literally see the cameraman just like pan from like the camera. And he's like, and his face has gone out and they just zoom the cameras and they, it's like the game hasn't started and they were just punching on the Aussies and the Irish. Cause it used to be this, do you remember, do you, remember I, you might not remember, but it used to be this huge build up that we're going to beat the shit out of each other essentially. And they used to be, it used to be on for yeah, here young it and old. Here it so here is. It is. <laughs> Australia, but we're delighted to have you here. As you can see, we're on the seventh floor of the Eddie Maguire. Well, we expected the fireworks to begin, and straight away it's on. McDonald's been Iconic voice, Eddie. No Michael in goals. No really. But, but it used to be big because there was a time when the Australian team was the all Australian team. So yeah, that's right. whoever got picked for the all, so the best, literally the best 22 players for the year in their positions would get sent over to Ireland. So it was a big deal. Like yeah. you didn't have, and then it started to fizzle out a little bit where they'd probably send, all right, we don't want to get our, our stars injured for the AFL season. But back then, like it was a superstar yeah, lineup. It and it drew, we all watched it. Like it was That huge. was actually, um, before I came over to Australia, I think I just signed the contract, but there was a VAFA team over. I can't remember the name of them. It was like a group of players maybe from the VFL that were joined together like that yeah. and traveled to Ireland. I think it was a VAFA. I think VAFA, you're right. Yeah. And they came over and my manager put me in touch with them at the time. And I was living in a house in uni with like six of my friends. And we were like, oh, we'll go. We'll go to one of their games. So we went to one of their games and then we were like, we'll bring you around Dublin. We'll show you around Dublin. I was like, I'll never see these people ever again. Like, they have haunted me since. I was like, <laughs> Malvern is a small place. <laughs> but all my friends who we had, um, we all had a night out in Dublin. You'd be familiar with the nightclub coppers, copper face jack, surely. No. It's a nightclub in Ireland. In Ireland, that's like, it's, it's not your revs, but it's like <laughs> anyone who is from... Anyone who goes to Ireland is like, I have to go to Coppers. It's iconic. Coppers. It's weird yeah. you say that because whenever we're overseas and then people we say we're from Melbourne, first question, Revs. Yeah. So I, is it I the yeah. same deal? Been there, but it's no. quite, Me too. It's, it, it's very like, it's Gaelic. It's um, it's a Gaelic crowd. Like after all Ireland finals, it's massive. But we were like, we'll bring the guys to Coppers. They absolutely loved it. <laughs> but they, the six girls who are living in... Yeah, no, so there's five of us living in that house and four of them are out playing here now. So, really? Mm. So the, the Aussie boys, they must have done something so to they, get them over. It, it, <laughs> caught, it, caught, it caught our attention. We were like, what is this game? We were all like, and all the girls like, maybe we'll go over. It just like, I feel like for Irish people, like you think in your head, stri- like you're like, oh, get over, travel, also play sport at the same time. But then you get over and you get completely invested and you're like, oh no, it's my job. It's my duty of care. Like I want to become way better here whereas at the start i think irish people are thinking oh this is really fun we should just go over but obviously like it's your full-time job mm. and you take it very seriously but that's what irish people's perception would have been at the start it's it's, it's really interesting I'll, I'll, well actually this is one off the cuff i don't know we'll get back to the sport shortly but uh like i, I was telling you off air so i moved into an area that's quite heavily or very close to heavily irish population and when i got my first haircut in the area he was irish and i was chatting to him and he was saying he's i think he came from cork he was saying the problem was every time he'd go out, it'd just be the same people and you kind of get to know everybody. In that area? In that area, yeah. at an island. W- w- where are your hotspots here in Melbourne, Sarah? Do you, are you a Richmond <laughs> operator? Are you a SB? Are you Chapel Street? I or? know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking I would be. SB? <laughs> Back in my younger days, maybe. Now I've matured oh, okay. beautifully. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm living Wineries in Richmond. on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, morning to Peninsula. <laughs> yeah. I'm living in Richmond now, so I tend to socialise a bit there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've been avoiding St Kilda because the Irish in me is um, needs to stay away from the Irish. Which yeah. are bad news. Yeah, <laughs> share a little bit about uh, like the new the new kind of gig with Performance by Design. Mm. Um, maybe share a little bit about the company. Uh, we obviously know it, but the listeners. 
they're not going to know it. Maybe share a bit about that. Yeah, Performance by Design is Paul Ray's company, um, who is obviously an incredible leader. So it's been, basically I've been working alongside them the last probably two to three years, kind of building connections, understanding what they do. And then in the last six months, I've actually taken on work with them. Um, but I wanted to figure out what the company is about. And I feel like unless you sit in on meetings and understand how they facilitate, um, I didn't feel like I could do my job well. So I think the nature of being an athlete, you're trying to kind of balance progressing in your career, but also putting all your attention into sport and being my main focus. So basically what we do is we facilitate for companies, corporate companies, sporting companies, anything really that involves team and everything involves team essentially. So making teams understand how they can be better work together, how they can better communicate. So we personality profile and um, if that's what the company is looking for we figure out you know behaviors that are acceptable unacceptable and we hold people to that then as well so like if you said you know a behavior that you don't want say would be maybe using humor to downgrade something someone did for example and then you put people into team activities and you watch and you observe the room and you might notice that humor is th the group might have said you know, in terms of the behaviors that they want and don't want, that humor is one, there's a cer certain time and place to use humor or whatever, and they put their behaviors down that are acceptable and unacceptable, but then you put them into team activities and you notice that generally people revert back to what they already know and they don't hold themselves accountable to what they said they don't want in their environment and then mm. how the flow and effect of how that might impact culture or how certain behaviors, certain things people are doing. So you just kind of call things out, but, and then when you profile people, you get to understand. What's the profiling process? So basically you do, it's like a questionnaire type thing and you figure out, they ask you all sorts of complicated questions and questions that you might be really uncomfortable asking, like answering at times. And then at the end of it, you get an insight into it. So you get to understand if you are, what type of personality you are, like where your strengths lie, where your weaknesses lie, what is conscious for you, what is subconscious for you, what you see in yourself, what other people see in you, and then how best to communicate with that person or how to manage them and how they would best lead. So you start to understand when I look at, and then uh, potential blind spots. So when I read my profile, I'm like, it's I sending it on to my dad and mom and just being like, how accurate is this? Like it was like things like blind spots that I wouldn't see is like one of my things would be like takes on too many tasks and might finish a task. And I'd be like, that would be so me. I'd be trying to do 10 things at the one time instead of like doing two or three things right. So something I'm really working on at the moment is trying to do one or two things. Hence my decision to just play AFL this Say year. Say no more. Say yeah. no more mm. and just play one sport. Whereas I've been playing different sports all the time. Love the change, love the challenge. But this is really uncomfortable for me to just focus on one thing. Like I, I get bored in the mundane nature of things. And same with career. I'm like, so like, uh, but I recognize I'm self-aware now to know from working in performance by design and from being really interested in the profile inside of things, like that's where my weaknesses lie. And then say you look at people who are, say the red type personality, it's like win at all costs. The yellow type is like very creative. The blue type is kind of strategic, wants to do a job, wants to do it right. And then you look at the green type who are like empathetic. So you're normally strong in, in two categories. And then your weaknesses I s essentially are in the other categories. And it doesn't mean that you can change them, reinvent the wheel, because say I'm red, yellow, the blue type, the strategy side, like I would struggle with that massively, but I put a lot of time and effort into that to you know, bring my weaknesses up even a tiny bit, but know that I'm naturally capable in the other two areas. Do you know? So it's like that understanding of, if you can understand how to better communicate, like I'll give another example, like, <laughs> Brie won't mind me saying this, our captain of Collingwood, she would say, okay, I'm just going to use going, because I'm Irish, going to the pub for an example. So It's been I brought up a few times so <laughs> far, so uh, it's only Thursday. Only but, uh, I don't, I actually, despite me bringing up the pub so much, I actually rarely go. What's it called? Coppers. Yeah, coppers. <laughs> yeah. That was back in my younger days, but you know, I'm obviously clearly still reminiscing, still fantasizing over the younger me. But it's all right, I was at the pub last night, it's fine. <laughs> so, sh like, Brie would ring me and I'd be like, we're meeting, so I'm, you know, straight to 
this is where we're going this is what we're doing don't ask me any more questions see you there so I'd be like okay meet you at the pub at four o'clock and I would sell the story because I'm yellow so I'd be like creative about it oh like we're going to do this we're gonna do that. it's going to be the best night like so many people are coming like even though I wouldn't even have half that information I'd be making it up <laughs> and <laughs> doing a few white lies uh, just to sell the story and then that, that's fine but Brie would be like the strategic kind of like empathy side so she would be like yeah but Chloe what time like and what drinks are we going to have what time are we going to have food and like what what are you wearing and also like are you sure that people are going to turn up and where's everyone going to stay and I'm like Brie forget about it yeah. I, that information is so irrelevant right now we'll figure it out <laughs> work it out later and she's just like oh you're so annoying give me more detail and I'm like Brie ask someone else just ring someone else about this because I don't have that detail but that's where we laugh and like because I understand her so and she understands me she just goes oh, I just know I'm not going to get that information from her mm. But in terms of sport, I have to work really hard at that so that I have organized in my week. My calendar looks like, you know, strategically planned. So I do do it. I hold myself accountable to journaling and all those other things so that I can get that side of my life ticked off. But it's hard for me. It's, it's really interesting because we've had a few chats on this show about what makes a good leader. And that's obviously such an open-ended question. So we've had leaders that have led with empathy. We've had leaders that have led with like... I'm, I'm, it's not. It's my actions, not my words. We've had the real tough, like, you know, I want it down the line, eye to eye, tell me how it is, tell me the truth, be brutal. But from listening to you speak, it sounds like kind of the direction we're moving in more leadership groups, um, in, in sports, you're seeing more co-captains, you're having like a bigger team. Do you think it's important to kind of cover off those four aspects of that wheel in a leadership group, whether it's in sport or in the corporate world? Yeah, well, if I was to think about a perfect leadership group, for me, it would be one of each colour yep. in so that you don't miss a beat. So if you have too many people like me who were, say, are red and are like, win at all costs, like we forget to do the other things. But then you have someone like Brie who goes, yeah, hold on a second, though. We can do that, but we have to do all these things to get to there. And then you have someone who's like, well, what about... Have we looked after? Have we checked in with the coaches? And we've have we checked in with the players? And then you have the creative person who can maybe sell the story. So then you have when you think about it, you have like mm. people who are like the on field leaders who are like, we can dictate here. Like that's what I would like the way I would look at it. Like make sure that you know what you're good at. Once you know what you're good at, you can execute that. And then if you had a leadership group being like, okay, you know that you're really strong in these areas. We need to give you more responsibility in these areas. Mm. And of course, if you want to develop yourself as a leader, which I always look at myself, I'm like, okay, well, I need to develop more in the blue area. So I am working on that or I need to develop on, I would say I'm empathetic again in my personal life. But when it comes to sports, I'm like, oh, come, I'm like, come on, get on with it. Because I'm like, sports hard. It's not always fair. Like, that's the way I think about things. But and I'm very much the action speak louder than words type person. So, but in but it's sometimes maybe I need to stop and think and go, hold on though, who's my audience here? Who am I talking to? Um, am I getting my message across? Like, they mightn't respond to me being like, get on with it. Like, so I need to, but when you understand people's profiles, you understand the room, it's so easy to communicate then. And it's just, you know, you know that I have to approach this person this way and that person that way. And it's not a one size fits all. It, it's almost something that every business and company or team needs. And I feel like, well, you'd probably know better than us, but working in businesses and working for other people, like it's it's not very common that, that, that a business like Performance by Design or, or another business of the similar, similar vein. But for you, like when you came into Performance by Design, were you n thinking I'm going to be going in and I want to eventually, I want to facilitate, I want to actually help? Or was it more of a... Uh, an ambassador role um, and now I, I guess exactly where are you in the business? Yeah, so that's basically I came in kind of with the idea of being a keynote speaker yeah. for performance by design. So now what our conversations are is that I want to facilitate and be a keynote speaker so yeah. be able to do both and kind of dip into both. Hence my personality, I like change, I like challenge. So I want to do kind of two things in the company rather than just be a facilitator, just be a keynote speaker. But at the moment, a lot of the things that we do is like we do team activities and then we use an example of the company. We use an example of what happens in, you know, their day to day life in 
corporate and then I would relate that to what how that would relate to a team meeting that we would have had in Collingwood so like you've lots of kind of short stories and things that are very similar to the corporate world as they are the sporting world but realistically it's all team it's all about how we work with people how we can better communicate and that's that's for everything in your life really isn't mm. it so it's so beneficial and like I just think it's really rewarding work and it's very purposeful and it feels like I'm fulfilling something it, bigger than you know bigger than yourself you feel like you're really helping people to understand and you can see like when you're in the room there's so many times where you're just like there's so many light, light bulb moments for people and you're like you know that can change their career and their path and where they're going and kind of getting them to understand that like communication is everything is, is there a fun activity we could play now is there something <laughs> what's, 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 what's something quick, quick. Or, or there's probably nothing quick i'm just trying to think what's something we could share with uh, what, what's an activity or a question that the listener or, or one of us is is commonly used in the in the process? Well, we would ask questions to like have icebreakers and stuff. So like, which you're not going to answer me when I ask this question. Right. But it would be to, to get the room to be kind of vulnerable or so that people would understand, like say someone in a corporate company could have been a, a leader, could have been be acting out a small bit and people... Some some people would be like, this isn't, I don't agree with the way he's, he or she is um, communicating with us. And then they could all of a sudden say, well, I've had a really hard time. My dad is really sick at the moment. And then someone goes, well, if we'd have known that, if you'd have shared that, we would have helped you. So it's like kind of getting out those things that like sometimes you have to share things in your personal life for people to understand that why you're just not feeling yourself. So like we would say something like, you know, tell the room something about you that no one else knows. Mm. Oh, is that a question? Go on. You go first. I'm trying to think. Um, the problem is I've shared everything on this show. Um, <laughs> yeah, we already know everything. <laughs> I've talked to uh, the most intimate details of every uh, aspect of me. What does the audience not know about myself? Bailey, what do you got? You got something? Yeah, come back. <laughs> something about you that no one in the room knows. I'm trying to think. That's, that's a really, it's like, and I'm sure when yeah, you I ask that question, there is a long pause. People are genuinely probably take a while to think about that. It's hard because we, sure. know, we know each other so stupidly well. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like yeah. We've lived together. We've traveled together. We, we work together every day. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot that you um, know. And we, and we literally share every intimate detail. Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Well, what's maybe one thing we could tell Sarah that Sarah wouldn't know about us? Um... Oh. This will be edited, uh, the, the pauses, it'll be... <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to think that's like some, something that's... Um, what's what's your footy tipping? <laughs> Who am I tipping tonight? You uh, could also say something like, what's the... Um, has there been a real defining moment in your life? Like, what's been the thing that's happened that's kind of changed you on another mm. direction? Like, I'm sure starting this podcast. Like For sure. Know, so you'd... It uh, could be a question like that. It could be, what... What is your biggest fear? Who it describe yourself in three words, and why? My biggest fear, I like that one. Yep. Yeah. Um, the wing star. <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 we've talked about this. Me and Dee talk about it, um, and we actually had a, a psychic medium on as well, which he was really, really cool. Oh, but so it was so interesting, yeah. and he did a live reading on, on us, and it was like spot on. It was weird, like mm. scary weird. Um, I've got this weird fear with like aging, like. Real fear with aging. I'm actually dealing with it at the moment. Like I'm 29, 30 in Jan, and I just I don't want to I don't want to grow up. And mm. I, like I genuinely fear aging. And I think because you slowly start to see your parents age, uh, it's not even the physical aspect. It's more just uh, you know like you're closer to the end than you are at the start. Mm. I think that's probably it. Um, what are you What are you afraid of? My biggest fear has always been regret. That's always one hundred. And I know it's very cliche, but that is it. And I think that that drives me though. So I use that to drive me that I'm like, all right, where do I want to be in three years, five years, 10 years? And what I'm, I'm really worried about you know, the whole deathbed analogy of just regretting not starting things or giving things a go or trying harder. And that's why like we're talking off air in, about communicating with people. Yeah. And sometimes that will drive me just to have those either harder conversations or those uncomfortable feelings because I'm, I'm like, well, there's so much more reward if you kind of go through it. Yeah. Um, I'm also not a, a fan of spiders, so <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What do you? What's your biggest fear? What's my biggest fear? I'm scared of the dark. Um, Are you actually? Really? Not really, but like as in if I was walking into the kitchen, I'd like... 
Oh. You know the old, uh, I must say, I used to be the runner, like you'd turn the light off and then run to your yeah. room. I used to do that all, it's all the time. Actually, that. What else am I afraid of? I probably as well, like not reaching my potential. Mm. And that's why I feel like I'm like very driven in like, and when I'm not kind of like working towards something or feeling like I'm learning every day. And we spoke about this off air as well, where it's like, you know, you can learn something from anyone and everyone in every day and every conversation if you think like that so like if you open the floor like if you talk to a stranger or if you talk to someone at work and decide to ask one or two more extra questions and we joke about the, the amount of questions that i ask but it's genuinely because i'm genuinely curious mm. as to you know like someone has everyone has a story like and everyone has something really interesting to share mm. and like you said that's why this podcast is great is because you have like all different people from different walks of life and it's not just like you know it's not just about football it's like there's so much more going on in people's life that people don't share and then we obviously talked about the, the social media side of things it's like you know people see a, a fraction of your life and they essentially think they know everything about you when you're like actually my social media is very much a lot of it is just fun or like yeah i don't really put up as much about like my personal life or anything like that so it's like people only know a tiny fraction of you so when you sit down and have like real authentic honest conversations it's like you learn so much can i ask you a question then and this is because this is something i've discovered about myself recently and i think i relate to what you're saying about constantly driven and you need things to do so one thing i really struggle with is i get i don't suffer from anxiety ever unless i have nothing to do mm -hmm. so and i noticed this recently like i actually got ahead of work i got ahead of all the editing and i'm sitting there on a sunday and i'm like got nothing to do like I've actually got no tasks everything's sorted for the week everything's done um I've just had <laughs> surgery so I can't go to the gym I can't do anything I'm like I've got nothing to do like I'm sitting here and I got literally I started feeling like like anxious like I'm like this is weird like I, I, do you suffer from a similar kind of feeling when you've almost you've got nothing to do or you've ticked yeah. everything off yeah massively it's it's actually a conversation I had with my dad during the week he's very similar to me as well in that space but like there was times where I had too much time and it's like that whole thing of, I said to you, everyone's saying to me, like, I think what you're after is focusing on one or two things mm. and just being, you know, really diligent with those things. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to pull out my hair. I'm getting bored. I need change. I need challenge. I need something else. And like, how do I find beauty in the mundane or in the, like, how do I find something else somewhere to kind of like stimulate me and feel like I'm, still progressing because the fear is to not progress mm. so you're kind of like okay how do i how do i better myself and then it's like i spoke to a sports i sp speak to a sports psych maybe once every two weeks i hold myself accountable to that because i just feel like is that the sports psych sports psych yeah. yeah it's like an objective view always of someone who doesn't really know much about your life but can just listen to what you're saying at that time so for me like i spoke about exactly what you're saying and I was like, I'm going crazy. Like, I was like, I feel like everyone's told me that I need to relax and just do things. I was like, it's not me to relax. Like, I like to be on the go all the time. I like yeah. to feel like I'm achieving something. And he was like, I was like, so I find it really hard to have downtime. So, like, even when I'm in the kitchen, I'm like, I'll listen to a book yeah. or I'll listen to a podcast because that will <laughs> stimulate my mind to be more creative. Yeah. And then I'll think bigger. You know, so, like, it's, like, even things like that. I'm like, could I just relax and just maybe sit there and aimlessly watch TV and not think? But it's, he said, basically, what was a good point and what I've tried to do this week. It's all, it's all trial and error with this stuff and then we're all figuring it out. But is like schedule time for everything you do. So mm, like Doss is big on that. Yeah. Schedule work nine to three and you know tasks you need to do in that time and then schedule downtime and mm. give yourself the break of going, that is when I'm gonna have downtime. So for me it's like okay, a Sunday. Whatever happens on a Sunday I can just do whatever I want. I can and what I say not that, feel guilty. Not feel guilty. So like last Sunday I was like, okay, right, I have a free day. I've nothing to do. So I just kinda went for a coffee decided i'll go to a breathwork class and i was like maybe i'll go to yoga i'll just check if one of my friends are around and it was like so nice to be so relaxed about mm. what i was doing but in the end by the end of the day i was still really productive yeah really yeah exactly i was still working towards my goals in terms of you know giving myself the time doing yoga whatever it is but i definitely struggle with that and i'm still trying to figure it out but what i would say is this week has helped me go time literally in my calendar time off appointment for me like if someone asks are you around five or six? No. And why? I have an appointment. The appointment's with myself. 
It's not even yeah. with mm. anything. I love that. You know, so it's it's just getting my mind tuned in a different way. But again, sports psychology is brilliant. Psychologists in general are amazing because they just see things from a different angle. I'm massive on the the whole scheduling of time. Almost too much yeah. though. So it's, it's important to have a balance. But what happens when you don't meet the requirements? I freak out. Yes, yeah, see, this yeah. is it. So that's and it's like and I'm to get comfortable with the yeah. flexibility. And like my girlfriend is so spontaneous, whereas yeah. I'm the opposite. So it's very much a bit of friction sometimes because if it's not in the calendar and um, it's not booked in within a week, I'm kind of like, well, no, we can't just go and do that because like I have to just do – and it might just be a simple task that I've got locked in, yeah. but I've got it locked in, mm. so I'm doing it. Like, you know, we're meal prepping or we're doing this or doing that. Um, and I, But I'm also a believer in that because like goal setting is something – it just gets spoken about like endlessly – I want to achieve my goals. I want to set goals. And it, it's, it's fun. I love that exercise. But the actual part of getting to it and achieving it is, is actually your processes like, and ticking off the boxes and actually looking at your calendar and using your calendar. Or, or um, like when you write it down, all right, my goal is this. When you write down the steps, it actually goes, oh, shit, like all I have to do is that yeah. like every day or every second. Like, um, I think that's why I love it too because if I don't achieve a goal, I get really annoyed at myself. So mm. it's kind of like, well, how can I break that goal down and, and ensure that I get to it? Well, I've got a calendar. Like, Do you use a calendar yes. pretty religiously too now? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And same thing. I would schedule it all out like that. And I've scheduled, I'd just say, my important appointments or whatever. But now I'm doing the more like, it could be like an hour of like clean the house. But it means that it's more focused time. It would be like an hour of focused work. Like small things I said to try not to go on social media till 12 o'clock like attend to yourself first I need to be better at that like yeah. social media it's just, it's just such a waste of time like while there's so much opportunity in it from a work point of view and all that stuff as well that some of them just like oh it's actually just a waste of time well he's good at that like you don't scroll I'm not a scroller but I do spend so, uh, I, I barely ever log into my own personal Instagram but it's but I've but checked us and I'm just checking stupid things I'm checking stats all the time I'm checking like TikTok followers TikTok comments so if you it, saw how often this man refreshes our downloads page to see <laughs> how many downloads like, no, I, like, I like seeing where in the I, I, I enjoy seeing where in the world they're downloaded which episodes but like, I enjoy that but I am bad at that but I'm interested in something you said earlier because about six or so years ago I got really and we both did really into like personal development so mm. similar to you and I, I remember I got to a stage where I lost a lot of weight. So I lost about 35 kilos of weight. And once I lost all that, then I went into this whole, okay, now I can achieve every, anything, you know, and I start setting all these goals. But it got to such a stage where I'm like, I couldn't even listen to music in the car because I'm like, it's not productive. I should be listening. I should be Steady learning. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, I can't, I almost remember like one of my mates wanted to, hang, this is horrible, like wanted to hang out. But I'm like, okay, what's it for? But that's like really bad mindset because yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to grow here. I'm not going to. Yeah. And I suffered in the end. I got like physically ill because, and they're like, you need to like, it's all stress related. Like your, your stuff, your, your guts are playing up because you're living in stress. You're constantly putting all these expectations on yourself. You can't like, it's too much in your head. Not like, sustainable. Yeah, yeah. Not sustainable at all. Have you ever dealt with almost burnout in that kind of mindset? Yeah. Massively many times. It's the same thing. It's like you're, trying to do way too much and you're doing nothing right mm. so then like I, it, again it's like goal setting but then bouncing it off a few people for a few different opinions because i think you can get really caught in your own way of thinking and go this is the way it needs to be and like that's what like mom and dad would say to me and like thankfully your parents are your best mirrors for you and i'm so lucky with my parents that they will just tell me straight and go you're too caught up in what you're doing at the moment like as in you're forgetting about these are the things that are important and you're like no but this is my priority at the moment and like i'm not doing everything i can and when it comes to crunch time or it comes to a big game or whatever my subconscious mind will play up on me and it will tell me that i haven't done enough and i said that's where i'll get found out so that's when you go back to processes again but you have to refine your process that you're not doing too much of something that's not even helping you yeah and then what's your priorities and then so I was listening to a book, I think it's Greatness Mindset is what it's called, uh, this week. And it was saying how, like, you know, if you look at your life from a health point of view, business point of view and relationships. So that those three categories and then see if you're happy in all those three. And then what's and you mark yourself out of 10. They asked a couple of questions, mark yourself out of 10 and where you are in each of those three things. And then you find out 
I suppose where you're maybe lacking but those three things like if you think about your relationships are, are they thriving or are you focusing too much on your business and then your relationships are suffering you know where are you expending your time but it was basically saying that if you're not balanced in all three of those areas that's you're going to you know come to a break yeah, at some point makes but sense the, it, the other thing that I would have looked at is what I studied um, it, I did life coaching a couple of years ago but have you ever seen the wheel of life I've heard of it. So I reckon I might have seen it, actually. It's basically like, it's the same thing as what I've just said, essentially, but it's cut into eight segments. So it's like relationships, friendships, um, romantic relationships, health, career, finance, finance, and physical environment, free time, fun. So then you mark them all out of 10. And then when you look at that wheel of life, generally when I'm like a bit off or something like, and there's something going on, I, I generally do the wheel of life and I go, where am I ex- not spending enough time? And then I'd go, oh, there we go, family. I haven't rang home in a week. Or it could yeah, be like okay. s- finance. I'm spending way too much money on stuff that I don't need or whatever. And it's just like, now, when I'm I'm speaking about this as if I have it all nailed, I absolutely don't. But it's a process to keep going back to when things don't feel right. But like the idea is you obviously try not to get there. So then for me, it's like the process of a psychologist helps me not get there as often as I would if I didn't have one. Mm. So, yeah, to answer your question, there's lots of things <laughs> to do. I don't know. <laughs> it's so I hard. Don't know. It, no, Life, it's so hard. hard. Life's hard. Like, <laughs> even just, like, you mentioned family and... Like, uh, 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 well, I even... I said it in our... Me and D and our good mate, Jai. Like, in my head, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I need to set a goal to see my mates. So I mm. said, I said, uh, you probably didn't even notice it, but it was literally a goal. I said in About our... the tennis thing. Yeah, 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 I said, let's go and have a hit of tennis every Monday on the month. Like the first Monday of the month. Like, let's just do it because otherwise I won't see Jai or you together. I only see you on your own and then I don't and see Jai. And we just Jai. work. And we just work. Like, Whereas a year's gone by and I'm like, we haven't even caught up, like, as mates, you know? Like, it's yeah. important. Like, and that's why, I mean, there's there's always room for spontaneity and, and go with the flow. And I'm trying my best to be better at that. But I also believe so heavily in everything in your life just – all right, if it's spending more time with your family, we'll schedule that time in and, yeah. and, and communicate it. Like, But it's definitely, like, sorry, to your point about getting too, like, focused on the structure. I was in that space a couple of years ago with um, training and I mm. remember just doing everything, like, regimented with everything I did. I remember talking to the sports psych and going, like, my friends are asking me to go out for dinner and a drink the night before a game. Like, are they for real? Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, and what happens if you do? I was like, well, I obviously won't perform. So, like, how do they not understand? The reason they don't understand is because they don't care. They're not associated mm. with sport. They're in their own realm and they just don't care. And why should they? So, anyway, she was like, I challenge you to go out for and have a pizza and a drink the night before a game. I was like, I couldn't imagine someone saw me. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, go do a challenge your um, inflexible mindset. So we talk about yeah. uh, being spontaneous, about your process, get out of your process. Yeah. And I said, she goes, no, I'm challenging. Like, you got to do it this week. And I was like, oh, my God. So anyway, I did it and then had the best game. B-O-G. Of my really? And the reason was, is because I challenged my mindset. I realized that I need to be flexible. I realized that on the field, you also need to be flexible. When you're too inside your head, you're too caught up. Yes. You're no good to anyone. But if I decided to go for a pizza and a drink every night, that's not aligned with my goals. But to know the difference between when you go, hold on, I've had enough. Like I actually, I, whatever I'm doing now is I'm gone too far the other way. It's like getting to equilibrium all the time. Mm. It's really interesting. I remember there was a really good story um, a few years ago from a professional player and his, his superstition was that he needed his boots to be pristine clean. And he said if they w- weren't clean to like perfection, he won't play well. He's a goal kicker. Brendan Favola yeah. shared this story. Yeah. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he shared this story and he said one of the best things ever happened was, you know, before a game, his coach came up and said, you know, how are you feeling? And he's like, yeah, good, good. And he basically just piled, I can't remember if he piled dirt on him or he stamped on his shoes, but he basically just messed them up. And it was like right before they're about to run out and he just went psycho. He's like, what are you doing? Like, blah, blah, blah. Goes out, kicks a bag of goals and he comes in and says, look, there you go. Dismiss. That theory's gone. Myth busted. It's like, I'm interested as an athlete, do you have superstitions? And, and countering, like I've tried to do that myself on a much lower level, but getting rid of superstition because it affects that you're talking about getting inside your head so how have you dealt with that if you yeah. if you have any the same thing and i even had a friend rachel karen she plays for geelong now 
she I was a part of her superstition, which was even worse. <laughs> oh, no. So I was accountable to her stuff. It's <laughs> a bit unfair. <laughs> what was it? She was like she was like, I need to go to your house on a Friday before a game. In my home house at home, we played together in with Mayo. You need to go to your home house. I need to see your granddad in the kitchen. I'm like, he's <gasps> wow. my granddad is not long from passing away. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, he's on so the verge. I don't know how we're gonna work with this long term. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> she was like, so she needs to see my granddad. Then we needed to drive to Innisgrown, which is a beach town, 10 minutes from our house. Then we had to pretend to mi- we missed the turn one day and we'd go in for a swim and we'd stay in the sea for 10 minutes exactly. And then we'd come back home and that was fine and then she'd go home. But because we accidentally missed the turn the first time, we had to accidentally miss the turn every time. So I had to do this whole, like, I'm going to distract you so that you do miss the turn. Oh, my God. Realistically, we know that you're going to, you know that you're Stop accidentally going. <laughs> to miss the <laughs> This turn. is crazy. So it was just, so this went on for, like, four or five weeks. And then we, she was like, I can't pretend that I don't see the turn today. <laughs> oh, no, it's to coming. <laughs> the turn. And then we lose the game. And she was, at the end of the game, I was like, Oh no! But so sh- to talk about superstitions, I got rid of mine well before that, but I jumped on board with hers then. So you know, <laughs> help yourself, help your teammates. Yeah, God, that's. Do you have any? Did you have any? Um, I did for a while. I can't remember. I I used to be. Yeah, it used to be. It was just an order. You had to. Um, Raffin a Dale style. Yeah, it was yeah. like certain boots. Put your mouth guard in this in this sock, and then it was always. I always had to be the first one. You know, when you do a lap around the square and then you run to the goals. I always had to. Oh, be yeah. f- I always had to win that race, <laughs> and I had to get my left foot in the one foot step into the goal square, yeah. and the right foot couldn't touch it. There you so go. So I had to hit an angle. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> but then one day I said no. I'm going to come last and I'm going to walk straight through it and it's not mm. going to affect anything. So you are, we, we meant, we briefly chatted about it and you've mentioned it a couple of times with social media. Um, <laughs> last year with the world cup, you copped a bit uh, online. You went back, played for, or you played for Melbourne victory, which is, which is awesome. But there was a bit of scrutiny around you switching codes for that to try and make your way into the world cup. Do you want to chat us through what you kind of had to overcome there? Yeah, it was, it was an interesting one and it was, it was definitely a challenging time because I was trying to do something that was really hard and, you know, in everyone's mind and everyone saying, like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm actually firstly going back to play a sport that I absolutely love that I hadn't played in eight years. And I felt like, like I said, I felt a bit trapped in AFL. I was like, you know, what? I haven't even grown up playing this sport. Like, I love soccer and Gaelic. I felt like I was depriving myself of some of my passions nearly. So I was like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to just send a couple of emails and see where this goes. And again, hadn't played in eight years. I could show victory in my clips of years ago. And they were like, we like, we, we see. But like, I was like, but it's eight years ago and I've trained to be an AFL player. And it's like saying to a doctor, you don't work for eight years. Do you remember everything? Mm, like, yeah. absolutely of course not. not. So I was going back, but I was ha- having to kind of say that, no, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Because I had to give him the belief that I believed in myself that I could do sure. it. Sure. So after a couple of weeks, he was like, I see where your mind is going. I see what you're trying to do, but you're not doing it. And I was like, I'm aware. I was like, but I know I'll get there. I was like, just give me time. Again, just had trained to be such a different type of athlete. I just moved differently and everything. Mm. And it was really interesting to see how am I preparing for what sports and and why do we do the things we do in AFL and why do we do, do things in soccer and how, you know, it's a unique situation, I suppose, coming from different codes that you're like, just because AFL does it one way doesn't mean that that's the right way for me or whatever and kind of making me become more individualized in my own preparation um, which helps but yeah so anyway then when I went back to play with Victory I was like people kind of like oh she's obviously going back for the World Cup I was like the World Cup would be an overarching dream and absolutely aim high and you might fall short of high but aim for mediocre and I probably would have never even got signed with Victory in the first place because I wouldn't have had a goal big enough to push me far enough so for me I was like I'll reach for the stars and who who cares if I don't get there but I know that from it I'll learn so much in the journey of it being hard I'll take the risk I'll dream big all those things but it was just I suppose there were so many comments around oh she's only going back to play the world cup oh she um who does she think she is trying to do that in six months and I was like I don't really think I'm anyone, to be honest. I'm just trying to do something that will probably give me more belief in myself and it will challenge me in a new way. It will make me think differently and I will 
bring it with me wherever I go in life and it'll probably just be a story to share and here we are talking about it yes. you know what I mean so it's like mm. it was that whole thing of just being like I would way rather take the chance take the risk but you're always going to get shit for that as well but people are be just like why do you think you can do that I'm like I don't actually think I can do it I don't actually believe I can do it but in my head I'm like maybe I can and why not try? Yeah. You know, so but from it, I, f I do feel like I gained a lot of belief. I challenged myself a lot and it kind of just made me think differently, came back, enjoyed AFL way more. So it was well worth my time. I got to spend time at home with my family. I got to, I also felt like I was giving back to the community, like in Ireland in ways like I was you know, going back to my roots, kind of feeling grounded again, played with the club then in Ireland. And it was really nice to go back to that. And, I think what I said to you is what I realized and it was going back to soccer taught me that all the relationships I'd built from when I was younger in soccer were still there and the people that helped me when I was younger helped me so much to get back to playing and like even some of my old coaches were like we'll take you for extras when you get back to Ireland every day of the week every morning if you want yeah. and I was like oh my god the amount of things that people did for me to even get back to play and then by the end of the six months I was like god I really want to keep going with soccer but I was like I had also made a commitment to Collingwood and to the club and to my team and I was like I don't want to let them down but I really really enjoy soccer and I felt like I was only finding my groove and then I was in the home base training camp for the Irish uh, team two weeks before the World Cup and the coach had said to me prior, obviously, when I, before I'd, when I first signed for victory, she's like, not an absolute chance, like in six months. I said, that's fine, but I'll die trying. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. absolutely, no worries. But then by, when I got into the home base camp, she was like, um, I didn't think you could get back as quick. <laughs> not like, bad, not bad. Yeah. I was like, but I'm still not there. But I still, I wasn't fully there, but I was close. I felt like I was close, but you know you didn't make it essentially but i'm okay with saying that as well and being like i didn't make it well it wasn't there yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah. the reason yeah. yeah that wasn't there was so much more yeah. to it than that but it's like the only reason i wouldn't say i was trying was like because i wouldn't want to hurt my own ego but i'm like you can't y your ego can be used in certain ways and for me i'm like use it on the field when you're trying to compete with someone else but like in other aspects of your life i'm like put it away because it, I don't think it serves you. I think it's much more admirable when people just go, yeah, I, I tried to do that. It didn't work. Like, mm, yeah. so what? hundred percent. You know, so that's the way I look at it. But it's, it feels like with soccer, I always kind of go, oh, I just, the other thing it did is open my mind massively to the world of sport. It was like, I met people from America, from Italy, coaches who were over in Ireland and they were like, you could play soccer in Italy if you wanted. You could go to France. Would you go to America? I was like, can you go mm. anywhere in the world with a sport? Wow. I was like, I forgot because I was so, so long outside the world and I was so absorbed in AFL that I was like, you know, maybe I'm thinking really small here and maybe I'm just, you know, you are what you surround yourself in. And I was like, there's actually a whole world out there. It's like saying, you know, you think when things are going wrong in your life that like it's the only thing that's happening in the world. And then you, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but this happens to me when I go to another country or even go to Sydney for the weekend, I come back and I go, why was I so bothered about that little thing that happened last week when there's, I can go, you can go anywhere, you can do whatever, but like, it's like, if you think like that. We often say that about where we came from on the Mornington Peninsula. And it is like, it's, I know people that have lived there all their lives and they probably won't live anywhere else. And that's great if they want to do that. But for us, like not even going overseas, like living overseas like you, I've never done that, but just, just getting out into Melbourne and living in the city or living into state for nearly a year like to me that that opened my eyes up and you've done some traveling and you're probably more of the more in that camp than I am too well I, I it's funny I remember I hope she she won't mind me saying this but my, my little sister I remember she went through a, a probably her first like major breakup right so mm -hmm. she would have been oh gosh 19 20 21 prime and she was yeah. cut she was totally upset and as she was, and I'm like, well, how do I, how do I, as a big brother, big brother, apart from go punch this bloke up, like, <laughs> how do I, how do I, uh, you know, approach the situation? Approach the situation. Yeah. But I remember walking with her and chatting. And I'm like, so where did you meet him? And I knew all the answers to the question. And I, and I love the bloke, still do, still get along with him. But they met at school. So I'm like, okay, so you've met, you've met this person at your school in your class, the same age. They, you live in the same suburbs. So I'm like, okay. And, you, and you're, you're totally upset. And you think there's nobody else, and I understand that. But I'm like, all right, 
what are the chances, if you do believe in soulmates, I personally don't, but I'm like, if you do believe in a soulmate, what is the chance that that soulmate is going to go to your school, the same age, your year level, lives a few streets away? Like when you go into the city, you're going to open up and you go like, holy shit, there's so many people. And then you go out to Australia. And then you first time you get on a plane and go to another country, you go to America or go to England, go to America, and suddenly you're like, I can't comprehend how many millions of people there are and potential matches and opportunities. And I remember like her, the way that kind of helped her mind too. And like, and it helped my mind back in the day too. So it's that small town, what would you call it? Small town syndrome kind of? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I agree with you. It's like it, once you expand your mind to possibilities, we're big and we're always big on dream big. Like mm. we've been told so many times that won't happen. That can't happen. And that just drives us even more. So, yeah. Yeah, it is. And I think that like you're saying, you're being the older brother for your sister there. It's like, where can you get the answers? Generally, people older than you, they have more life experience. Like I love speaking to my grandparents or like an older generation because I'm like, they've been through it all. Like you tell them yeah. stories about a breakup and you're like, you know, again, like you might think it's the end of the world. And then you're like, actually, there's so many great people out there. If you take the time to be present, if you're not present, you can spend your whole time in your phone if you want. And you can decide to, you know, pine over someone that probably will never come back into your life again. Do you know, so mm. it's like, but if you decide to open up and kind of be like, there is a world of opportunity out there that you're like, you don't, you get unfazed by everything. You're like, yes, whatever things are going to happen. It's going to be hard. Prepare for hard. Like, know that hard things are around the corner. And, like, I think that's the way I think about it. I, like, life can be can be so hard. Some people are extremely unlucky, but you just, you won't, like, it's the way you view those things as well. It's like, I don't want to be a victim of life. Like, if something bad happens tomorrow, I want to know that I've built my mindset. Like, you can never be prepared, but be somewhat prepared. That if something hard happened tomorrow, that I would be okay. Um, but that's a constant work. I think you need to work on yourself every day to just get stronger and stronger all the time, I think. But I think sometimes there's ultimately things you just can't prepare for. Mm. Oh, great. Well, do you reckon we... I think it's time. It's, it's yeah. time. Does you get the golf box up. Before you do, do you speak Gaelic? A uh, small bit. <laughs> Can you teach us anything? Conasathothe. Uh, Conasathothe. Is that what you said? <laughs> do you again? No, you say it. So it's Misha Sarah Kenny Rua. What? My name is Sarah Rowe. Yeah. So I come from County Mayo. And what else? <laughs> <laughs> go on, go on, give it a go. Green egg tan of despair. The sun is shining in the sky. Uh, wait, I thought you said despair. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said something about despair. I thought I heard that too. Um, what else? Yeah, I'm. To be fair, as in I don't speak much of it. I can you give us an Irish more. accent, Doss? Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. In, I'm not insulting Sarah. In Sarah, can you it, give no. us an Aussie accent? Oh my God, absolutely not. But can you do an Irish accent because Aussies try every single time they meet me. The they difference repeat. between Irish and Scottish is you got to be softly, soft, soft spoken. Give me a Irish. sentence to say, and I'll give it a crack. Um, Collingwood. Is the best club in the whole universe. Oof. Change it to Bulldogs for you. <laughs> Collingwood is the best club in all the universe. It's not know. bad. I don't know. That's really good. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> that like was actually listen, very good. When I listen to <laughs> Harvey Sid, I'm like, oh my God, do I sound like that? No, you like didn't. Farmer. No, I don't think you I sound like that. I thought you sounded very good. Really? Yeah. Okay, you go. Colling <laughs> um, Collingwood is the best club in the universe. <laughs> That's not, that, was, that was more like my voice. Bono? Kind of, <laughs> Bono. That's, how I was trying to, Bono. that's how I was trying to process it. <laughs> <Bono. laughs> so, All right. What's in the Golf Box is brought to you by Golf Box, Australia's greatest golf superstore. And Australia's greatest golf sale is on now at Golf Box. Up to 50% off clubs, clothing, and shoes. Plus, score huge savings on your golfing favorites and essentials. Head to golfbox.com.au. We love Golf Box. We and do. that sale is on now, isn't it? 50% off. Get I'm, in there. Now is the time. So mm. this, this, I've been told by them it's not going to last long, about two weeks. Okay. So get on now, 50% off your clubs, Doss. I reckon you'll, you'll make the most of that. Sarah is about, now you're not into golf currently, are you? No, but I am we're about to podcast. we're about to get she you, will be. we're about to get you quite involved with golf. And we're going to set send you home with some nice goodies. But before we do, you have to take on the golf box. So inside the golf box, there's unpredictability, isn't mm. there? 
challenges galore, questions galore. It's it's overflowing. I can see. So, uh, geez, you've emphasised that heavily. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's overflowing with challenges. So, Sarah, all you have to do is put your hand in there, pick one out, and complete the challenge or question to go home with the prize. Okay, I'm scared. Unpredictable. That's the way people describe me. So this is perfect. Oh, I got. Oh, two. she's picked two. Yeah, put one back. Put one back. There all right. Go. What did you get? What's the dumbest injury you've given to yourself? Now we love that from the athletes. Yeah, it's always a good athlete. I'm one, sure you've. One. I'm sure you've had a few injuries over the time. But what is the dumbest? It doesn't have to so be sport related. The dumbest injury I've had is happened to me a couple of weeks ago when I moved to Richmond. So obviously trying to make new friends and stuff, and I was, you know, wanted to wanted to try to be the cool girl on the block around my area. <laughs> anyway, I was getting out of my car. And I have my phone in one hand and I had shopping in the other hand. And as I'm getting out of my car, I somehow start to trip over my own shoe, (laughs) over my own sandal. But like as I was falling, like my mind went to, you know, so resilient as an athlete. I'm going to redeem myself here. Like I'm obviously going to find my feet again. Well, this this is in point three seconds. Yeah, There was so many things going on in my head. The other thing that I took notice of again is like you know as you do in football it's important to scan the Awareness. field so i was scanning my peripheral vision and I'll, as i was falling i was like oh my god there's like 20 people around they're all like kind um, of younger generation oh as well <laughs> it's really no. bad <laughs> the new girl on the block is face down <laughs> next thing fell flat on my face oh. like everything went everywhere phone gone shopping shopping everywhere and like I could see so many people being like, oh. <laughs> just had an adult fall. Like who falls at this age? You just don't. Oh, we've seen you a couple. Only <laughs> fall <in school>. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many people, and everyone was like so flustered. Like people were trying to Helping stop laughing, but everyone was like, "Oh my god, are you okay?" And I was like, "No, everyone, permission to laugh. Just like leave just me be. I was let like, me get I don't it. Oh. What to do?" So embarrassed. Anyway, got up, had a massive cut on my knee, got into oh. my car, was obviously in knots laughing. But I think the worst part about it was I had no one to laugh with other than myself. So, you know, when you're like, if someone else was there, I would have just sat on the ground and laughed and Pissed just yourself. accepted defeat. Whereas I was like, <laughs> no, literally got up, ran into my car. I was like, everyone was like, oh, are you okay? I was like, whatever. I got into the car and I was like, oh, my toe is really sore. My baby toe. And I was like, ah. Oh, so you're in sandals. So I was in sandals. Oh. So I need a massive cut in my knee, cut in my hand. And I was like, ah, whatever, leave it. And then a couple, couple of days passed and I was like, this toe wasn't getting any better. I was doing running. I was like, this is really sore. Next thing, two weeks later, still sore. And I was like, I had to say to the physio, I was like, oh, there's something wrong with my baby toe. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> Calling it a baby toe as well. Like, oh, can you check my baby toe? But... <laughs> She was like, um, that's fractured for sure. And she's like, how did that happen? Anyway, told her the story. <laughs> oh, so here that's we are. Well We're done. recovering. We're yeah. recovering. Well, well how done. is the baby toe? It's getting there. It's still getting sore. There. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is hilarious. I mean, I mean, all you needed is someone to go, is that kind of superstar Sarah Rowe that's just gone <laughs> yeah. down? The just gone down. waiting for someone to say to me, I saw you. But <laughs> 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 your face out so cool. Uh, well, fa- well yeah, also, you're about to head to America, aren't you? Yes, heading to America on Which Saturday part? at Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. So we're going, there's 10 of us going on a training camp. Is training? That high altitude kind of stuff? Kind of, yeah. yeah. So the, it's called Exos, the place we were going. I think the Essendon boys went. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Okay, so we went yeah. To that same place. Beautiful. So we're going for two weeks. So I would call it a productive holiday. And then return to finals for Collingwood? Return, yes. Yes. We return to VFL, I think, for like as well for like six weeks and mm-hmm. then we're into oh, yeah. pre-season yep. started of June so it'll all come around pretty quickly but it's been it's been a long off season so yeah far. a bit are you yeah. feeling confident about the next season Do yeah well looking forward to it I think it's like we've new coach everything is essentially mm-hmm. new like with that comes change challenge but excitement and everyone's starting from scratch again I feel like it's you know a level playing field for everyone so I'm really excited about it and I think there's you know new fresh energy around the place is always great well, we're very excited to watch you in action. We're going to be watching very closely. Doss, uh, do you want to go through the prize pack for today? Uh, golf box, they're giving you a $250 voucher. So you're going to have to get... Well, tell you what, now with the 50% <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, wait, wait a couple of weeks. For, 
<laughs> Did you think that was a little real voucher? Envelope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, don't thank check, you. Don't that's, go try opening that. That's our novelty check. Uh, so <laughs> giant check. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, make that actually wait a couple of weeks and make the most of that fifty percent off. Yeah. You get double the value. You get five hundred dollar gift voucher. Really. Um, and our naming rights partner, Fleet Plant High Solutions. They're they're golf mad as well, but they're an earth moving company. They love their golf. They've got uh, a little goodie bag with some golf essentials too. So what's in that? You've got a, you're going home with a towel couple pairs of socks, different colors, which is lovely. Golf balls, golf tees, and a golf glove as well. So we're decking you out, Sarah, and you'll, uh, you'll be ready to hit those uh, those greens. <laughs> Watch me go. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, right. Sarah, you've been a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. We've, we've loved the chat. It's gone in so many different directions. Yeah, I did not expect it, but yeah. it's been great. Yeah. Thank you very much. And there is many more directions we could go in, but we will have to leave it at that. Next one will be in the sauna. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 20 questions. <laughs> 20 questions. Looking forward to it. But uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you.